Hi, this is Professor Len Kelly, and this is the first of two presentations designed to introduce you to multiple regression models using matrix operations. We have already taken a look at the simple linear regression model using matrix operations, and so today's presentation is simply an extension of that. You'll notice in the model that we're going to discuss today that we have p minus 1 regressor variables or equivalently p parameters, beta 0 through beta p minus 1. Now it's important for you to understand that in the presentation that I'm going to make here, p represents the number of parameters. In some textbooks and articles, p is the number of P is used to represent the number of predictor variables. Don't get confused. In our particular model, we have P parameters and P minus 1 predictor variables. The model can be written in matrix notation. Notice that our X matrix is just an expansion of what we saw in the simple linear regression model. Instead of only having one predictor variable, now we have P minus 1 predictor variables, and we have N observations associated with each of those predictor variables. So uh, again, it's important for you to remember that uh, our X matrix has to have this column of ones, and that's important so that we can capture the intercept term beta zero as we describe our model. So the one multiplies the beta zero, then variable x1 gets multiplied by beta 1, variable x2 gets multiplied by beta 2, and finally variable uh, xp minus 1 gets multiplied by beta p minus 1, and the pot's right and the size is right, and you know it's just a, a convenient way to represent the model that we're interested in analyzing in today's presentation. Again, our goal is to find a model such that we minimize the sums of squares error and the estimators that we would use then for our regression coefficients to do that, to accomplish that goal of minimizing sums of squares error, can be written as you see on the bottom line of this uh, little proof here and again on this slide. Now notice that this column vector of estimators, this column vector B0, B1, BP-1, which is used to estimate the regression coefficients, which are parameters beta 0 through beta P-1, involves the inverse of a matrix. And we know from previous conversation that every matrix does not have an inverse. We can guarantee that this matrix X transpose X will have an inverse if the predictor or regressor variables that we use to build our model are linearly independent. And so we'll want to go back and review what that means. And we know that these these column vectors associated with our predictor variables x1, x2 through xp minus 1 will be linearly independent if none of them can be written as linear combinations of the others. And so this is just an arithmetic problem now, but it's an important problem that requires the uh, existence of this in matrix inverse. If we want to find the fitted value associated with a particular level of x, that is for a particular observation, say observation h, where the value for uh, the first variable is xh1, the variable for the second variable is xh2, the variable for the pth predictor variable, p minus 1th predictor variable is x sub h p minus 1. We simply hit those values associated with uh, our predictor variables by their corresponding estimated regression coefficients and add them up. And that's what that matrix notation, that matrix arithmetic that you see illustrated on this slide will do. Now, if we want to find the fitted values associated with all the observations that we have in our data set, then we just take the X matrix. Now, remember to include that that column of ones in the X matrix, and we hit that X matrix by these estimated regression coefficients, which are in the in the column vector B, and we get all of the fitted values corresponding to the observations that we have in our data set. 
it turns out that uh, this H matrix, which is X times X transpose X inverse times X transpose, it plays an important role in model validation and the validation of the, the assumptions in the analysis of uh, residuals that are required to validate those assumptions. And we will see that hat matrix again. It will play an important role in our analysis of, our, of any regression model that we build. And as I mentioned, the residuals are, are, are important in doing that kind of analysis. And the residuals themselves can be written a, as an expression involving that same hat matrix, as you see on this particular slide. These estimators, B0, B1 through BP minus 1, which is in the column vector B, they're unbiased. Here's a little proof to demonstrate that. And so we know that these estimators, B0, B1, BP-1, are, um, you know, the kind of estimators we would like to have. That is, they have this quality of unbiasedness. We can also, it's a fairly involved computation, but we can also compute the variance of this vector of estimators, B. And it turns out that that variance is couched in, the ter in terms of a matrix, the x transpose times x inverse matrix hit by the scalar sigma squared, where sigma squared represents the population variance, that is the variability of our obs observations at every level of x. And unless we have the entire population, we will not know nor be able to calculate sigma squared. But we're not too put off by that because we have discovered, in fact, I think we have pro have proven that mean squared error, that value which we can compute, or Excel can compute for us more easily probably, the mean squared error turns out to be an unbiased estimator for sigma squared. And so if we want to construct the variance-covariance matrix associated with our estimators B0, B1 through BP-1, we simply need to compute the X transpose X inverse matrix and hit every element in that matrix by the scalar, by the value, mean squared error. And so we have this variance-covariance matrix, and I'm hopeful that you remember how to read such a variance-covariance matrix. That is, the variances are on the diagonal, and the covariances are on the off-diagonals. And this would be a symmetric matrix because of that, because the covariance of B0 with B1, for example, is exactly the same thing as the covariance of B1 with B0. And I will show you uh, some computations associated with such a matrix in, in an example that we'll do in, in, in just a few minutes. I also want to introduce a term called the coefficient of determination. Very important. Sometimes I think too much importance is placed on it, but I'll have more to say about that in just a moment. But I do want to show you how to compute R squared, the coefficient of determination associated with a regression model. And to do so, I want to use this identity that you see on the top line of this slide. Now clearly, the top line of this slide is true, because yi minus y bar has to be equal to yi minus y bar. And what I've done on the right-hand side is simply added and subtracted the y sub i hat. So clearly, what you see on line one is an identity. Now, what I have done and haven't shown completely here is I've taken and squared both sides of that first line. And when I square both sides of that first line, notice the right-hand side is an A plus B term. There's two terms there. Let's just call them A and B. And when we take A plus B quantity squared, remember, we get A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. Well, the 2AB is missing in the second line of this slide. And that's because, in this instance, that inner product term would go to zero. What you see on the left is a measure of the variation of the observed values y about their mean. It has nothing to do with the model. Notice, it has everything to do with the observed values y sub i. It's a measure of the dispersion of those values y sub i about the mean 
of those values squared and summed. The sums of squares total is what we call that. And it can be broken up into these two pieces. Again, you might want to prove this theorem or you might want to accept uh, you know, its validity. Uh, I guarantee what you see on this slide is correct. And so the sums of squares total can be broken up into two pieces. The first is the sums of squares error. It is the difference between the observed values and the fitted values, squared and summed. The second is what we call the sums of squares for regression. Now clearly, both sums of squares error and sums of squares for regression are dependent on our model because they are both dependent on y sub i hat. And y sub i hat comes from the model. So the model influences sums of squares error and sums of squares for regression. And what do we want to do when we build a regression model? We want to minimize the sums of squares error. Well, if we're minimizing the sums of squares error, and the sums of squares error plus the sums of squares for regression, let's go back, if the sums of squares error plus the sums of squares for regression equals the sums of squares total, then as sums of squares error gets smaller, the sums of squares for regression has to get bigger. And so if we want to minimize the sums of squares error, then that's equivalent to saying we want to maximize the sums of squares for regression. Now, the sums of squares total doesn't change. It is what it is. It's a measure of the variation of the y observ observations about their mean. It has nothing to do with the predictor variables. It has nothing to do with the model. But the sums of squares for regression represents the proportion of that very, excuse me, represents a measure of variation associated with the model. And so SSR over SST represents the proportion of the total variation, that is, the proportion of the variation of the y observations about their mean, which is explained by our model. And clearly, we want that to be a big number. And that number will be made big as sums of squares error is made small or equivalently, as I, I'm repeating myself now, as some squares for regression is big. And so people are intent on building models that have high R-square values. And I just want to offer up a little bit of a caution about that. It turns out that R-square is not an absolute measure of the appropriateness of the model. Some people tend to think it is. I do not, and neither should you. Because you could get a high R-square value, and, and the model that you've proposed isn't even legit. It just turns out that you know it, it provides a high R-square value, but the model itself is fouled. So we are, in the 431 course, going to spend some time thinking about the appropriateness of our model. Is it really the model we should be using? But for, for today's discussion, I want you to understand that you could have a high R-square value, and the model that you're deriving isn't even the appropriate model to be using. High R-square value can be manipulated too. Excuse me, R-square values can be manipulated too. If we simply increase the range over which our predictor variables uh, are, are taken, R-square can get bigger. It would be wrong to do that just to make r square bigger, but it could be done. It is a mathematical artifact. Large r square values do not necessarily guarantee that our model is accurate. Here's, here's a simple illustration. Suppose that we have a million units of variability and they observe values y about their mean, and our model explains 900,000 of them. That is, sums of squares for regression is 900,000. And so we take 900,000 over a million and we get an r square value of 0.9. But that still leaves us with 100,000 units of unexplained variability of the obs observations about their mean. Now, a if that 100,000 units of unexplained variation causes us, you know, to, to have, a mo have results which are inaccurate, then that R-square value of 0.9, even though it's extraordinarily high, doesn't do us a bit of good. Now, there's one other aspect of R-square that and I really want to raise a flag about, and that is R square value can be artificially inflated simply by including additional predictor variables. And so some people, it would be unethical, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that 
you know, some people probably have included variables in a regression model that on the face of it have absolutely nothing to do with the response variable that your interest that they're interested in and they simply plow these extra predictor or regressor variables into the model in an effort to inflate r squared that my friends is certainly wrong and so some people have uh, adopted the use of R-squared adjusted. R-squared adjusted takes into account not only the change in the sums of squares for regression or equivalently sums of squares error, but also the number of predictor variables that you have thrown into your model. Now, I don't usually worry too much about R-squared adjusted. It is, you know, a value that you probably should look at. The only time that I get really concerned is, is, is if R-squared adjusted is significantly different than the R-squared value. Because that is evidence that maybe you have some variables in the model that shouldn't be there. And so I would invite you, and Excel produces this R-squared adjusted uh, value, I would invite you to take a look at R-squared and R-squared adjusted. And if you see big differences in those numbers, then you might want to do some additional uh, inquiry. If we take these sums of squares, sums of squares error, and sums of squares for regression, and divide them by the degrees of freedom associated with each, we get something called mean squared. We get the mean squared error when we take sums of squares error and divide it by n minus p, and we get the mean squares for regression when we take sums of squares for regression and divide it by p minus 1. Now, we have already shown, and we've talked about it even today again, the fact that the mean squared error is an unbiased estimator of sigma squared. So the expected value of mean squared error is sigma squared. The expected value of mean squares for regression is sigma squared plus some other stuff unless all the beta sub i's are equal to 0. And if all the beta sub i's are equal to 0, then the ratio of mean squares for regression over mean squared error would be small. If all the beta sub i's were equal to zero, then the um, ratio of mean squares for regression over mean squared error would be close to one. So if, oh, it turns out, let me go, let me go back one slide. It turns out that this ratio, under the assumption of normality, has an F distribution with P minus 1 and N minus P degrees of freedom. And so, this statistic F gives us a way to test whether or not there is a linear relationship between our set of predictor variables and our response variable. Because we can test the null hypothesis that all the uh, that, that all the regression coefficients beta 1 through beta p minus 1 are equal to 0 versus that not being true now notice that the alternative doesn't say they all have to be uh, uh, non-zero the alternative simply says that not all of the regression coefficients are equal to 0 some of them could be but not all of them and if not all of them are equal to zero, then if not all of them are equal to zero, then that means that mean squares for regression in an expected value sense is going to be bigger than mean squares error. Which means that ratio is going to be big. And so, if our test statistic F, that is, if mean squares for regression over mean squared error is big, then that means we would reject the claim that all of the regression coefficients are equal to zero in favor of the alternative. So, large values of F are indicative of a linear relationship between our set of predictor variables and our response variable. Large values of F are indicative of a linear relationship between our set of predictor variables and our response variables. Equivalently then, small values of F
would lead us to conclude that there is no linear relationship between our um, set of predictor variables and our response variables. And we'll do an example to illustrate this. Before we get into this example, I just want to introduce, and I kind of and, and begging your indulgence here a little bit because I want you to accept some of this. We're going to talk about indicators in great detail a little bit later in the, in our uh, course, but for now, I just want to introduce them because the data set that I have involves uh, a couple of of uh, qualitative variables, and we haven't discussed how to handle them yet. So here's just a little entree into that, and we'll come back and discuss this in great detail uh, later in our course. For now, I'm going to ask you to accept a few things. Bottom line is, if we can include qualitative as well as quantitative variables in a regression model, if we want to include qualitative variables like gender, employment status, political affiliation, etc., um, we, we have to do so through the introduction of what are called indicator, or some people call them dummy variables, some people call them binary variables. Uh, I like the word indicator. A qualitative variable, now again, the example that I'm going to show you will illustrate this, and I don't want you to get too concerned about it right now. I'm asking you to accept some of this stuff for today's presentation. We'll discuss it again later on. But a qualitative variable that has A levels requires A minus 1 indicator variables be used in the model. And you'll see what I mean by that in a moment. So here's the example that we're going to use. Suppose an economic researcher wants to understand and, and analyze the relationship between monthly housing payments and the following explanatory or predictor or regressor variables. Total debt that the family has, the family size, the location in the neighborhood, the gross annual income of the, of the first wage earner, the average monthly expenditure on utilities, and whether the residence is owned or rented. Now location is clearly a qualitative variable. Whether you own or rent, that's a yes or no. That's a binary thing. That's a qualitative variable, too. And so what I want you to remember is this slide. Now, you, you'll want to print these out so you can go back and remember what we're using. We're using debt as our um, regressor variables. We're using debt. We're using location. We're using family size. We're using income of first wage earner first wage earner. We're using the expenditure on utilities and whether someone owns or rents their uh, residence. And again, I have some data that uh, is taken for 500 households. And I would ask you to you know, look at the comments associated with this data set. Well, let me scroll all the way over so you can see them all. So here I've labeled the household numbers. Here's the monthly payment, home mortgage or rent payment. The family size is obvious. The location, one if you're in the southwest sector of the neighborhood, two in the northwest, three in the northeast, four in the southeast. Now clearly location is qualitative. I could have just as easily labeled them using notations A, B, C, and D. Or a, B, C, or D. Yeah, that's four. Or I could have used, instead of 1, 2, 3, and 4, I could have used 162.8, 3,000, and a quarter million. They're, they're representations. They're, the, the, the value of those things that I use to represent the location has absolutely no significance in terms of a meaningful ratio. And so clearly, these things are you know uh, arbitrary. And that's why we don't want to use, you know, them in the construction of our model. Because someone might, instead of calling them 1, 2, 3, and 4, someone might call them 4, 16, 32, and 64. Or A, B, C, and D. The important thing is that those location and likewise ownership are qualitative. And in order to include include those qualitative variables in our model, we have to replace them. And we have to replace them with these things called indicator variables. Now again, I'm pleading with you, don't get spun up about it today. We will come back to that uh, 
in this course and discuss in great detail the use of indicator uh, or dummy variables. For now, here's the data. What I've done is I've created these dummy variables using some if statements. And so if you're in location 1, then this variable location underscore 1 is going to be a 1. If you're not in location 1, and you can see that, go back. If you're not in location 1, then this variable is going to take on a 0. If you're in location 2, then variable location underscore 2 is going to be a 1. Otherwise, it's going to be 0. And if, in your, if you're in location 3, I'm going to make that equal to 1. Otherwise, it's going to be equal to 0. Now, we're only going to use three of these location variables, three of these dummy location variables. And the reason, and I'm going to use loc1, loc2, and loc3. And the reason we're only going to use three is because if we use four, then those four variables are linearly dependent. Think of it. If you don't live in location one, and you don't live in location two, and you don't live in location four, excuse me, if you don't live in 1, you don't live in 2, you don't live in 3, then you definitely live in 4. There's a dependence amongst these four location dummy variables. And if we used all four of them, then when we try to compute x transpose x inverse, we couldn't. And so we're going to use 3. And again, I don't want you to get overly concerned about them. Now, we cannot do analysis on if statements. So what I've done here in this tab called Multiple Linear Regression Data 2 is I've taken those values under the location variables and I've pasted them as values using the paste special. And so now you see there's no formulas when I go in there. There's just the numbers now. And again, I'm not going to use loc4, location 4, in the model that I built. And, and, and I just don't want you to get overly concerned about it. Now, what I have here is I have the data, I have the family size, I have whether they own or, op or rent, I have the first income, the utilities, the debt, and then I'm going to use these first three location variables when I build the model. Now, I've done that using matrix notation. So here's my X matrix. Notice it's my data with an additional column of ones. So here's, you know, the constant term. Here is the first variable. I probably should have labeled them family size. Let's do that right now. Let's just take and copy and then come over here and uh, paste them. So we have them. We can look at them. So what you see here is, is my X matrix, which is my data matrix with an additional column of ones. And then if you scroll over to the right, you'll see that I've computed X transpose X. And then I've taken X transpose X inverse. And then I've taken X transpose times Y. And finally, using matrix notation, I've computed this vector of estimated regression coefficients. So here's my intercept term, 593.76. Here's the coefficient for the estimated regression coefficient for family size. Here's the estimated regression coefficient for what was my what was my uh, second variable? Family size debt level, I think, right? Nope, ownership. So the, there's my column vector of estimated regression coefficients. I'll show you these more a little bit later. And then, oh, hey, I've gone so far as to take x transpose x inverse, hit it by mean squared error, and so here's my variance covariance matrix. I derived all this for you using matrix arithmetic, and you can see those formulas if you scroll around this worksheet a little bit. And then I took the square root of these diagonal entries on the variance covariance matrix to find the standard error associated with my regressor, uh, or excuse me, my um, uh, 
estimated regression coefficients. Well, we can do all this in Excel too. So let's go back and uh, do that in Excel. Rather than doing all that matrix arithmetic ourselves, we could come back here and go to data and go to our data analysis tool pack and scroll down to regression, hit OK, and my Y input are the monthly payments and so we find them so there's my 500 monthly payments and then my X variables my input range for my X's are going to be the family size location through uh, ownership first income utilities debt location one two and three notice I do not grab location four and then I scroll down and I get those 500 observations associated with those whoa with those uh, regressor variables notice I did take the labels and uh, at this point I'm not worried about residuals and normal probability plots but I do want to send this to a worksheet that I can look at so let's call it MLR OUT OUT and when I hit OK it's gonna cook and it's gonna produce something that looks like this and of course I've already done that and enhanced it a little bit in my worksheet and so here it is and notice here is my vector of estimated regression coefficients remember the 593 the minus 40 the 74 etc Excel built them for me lickety split here are those standard deviations you remember seeing them there's the standard deviation associated with um, you know B0 we had already done that over here on the uh, MLR data 2 worksheet matrix computations out here to the right do you remember we just talked about them there are my estimated regression coefficients using matrix algebra here are my standard errors my 381 and if I go to my Excel output there it is and so I don't really need to worry too much at this point about using matrix operations to produce the results associated with my regression model Excel does them for us and you see them here now just as a reminder I put in a little cloud here go to the MLR data 2 for the matrix arithmetic and convince yourself that you can do it now how do we interpret these things it's important for you to remember that these are partial derivatives they are rates of change given that everything else stays the same and so when we say that the coefficient for family size is minus 40.79 what we really are saying is that when the family size increases by one member the monthly payment will decrease by forty dollars and seventy nine cents provided all the other variables are the same that is the household is uh, in the um, same status of own or rent it's in the same location they have the same annual income and they have the same um, debt level and utility bills as someone else with one fewer family member so again this notion of rates of change partial derivatives the coefficient for uh, the ownership variable is 74.72 now remember ownership was one renting was zero for that particular qualitative variable and so what this says is if someone owns their home their monthly housing payment is seventy four dollars and seventy two cents greater than someone who rents their home the coefficient for annual income was about point zero 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 two 
And so what that means is when the gross annual income of the first wage earner increases by $1, the monthly payment falls by about $0.0002. That regression coefficient was negative. So again, I want you to read through these. I want you to understand you know, what the coefficients mean and spend a little time convincing yourself that you can interpret them. Now, the baseline location was location four. Location four. And so these regression coefficients associated with um, our, the model that we built, which did not include location four, which was the uh, southeast neighborhood. These then are all relative to that southeast neighborhood. So when a home is located in the southwest sector, that is location one is equal to one, then the typical monthly payment is $252.51 greater than the similar house located in uh, location four or the southeast section of the neighborhood. So here's a question. Where's the most expensive neighborhood? For a particular family with a particular size, whether they own or rent, and a particular debt level, a partic utility payments, particular income. If that family lived in the northwest section, they would be paying on average $362.69 more per month than that same family that lives in the southeast section. And so they, that family pays about $110 more than a family that lives in the southwest section because 362 versus 252 is about 110. So the most expensive location is the northwest sector of the neighborhood. Again, we're going to talk in great detail about indicator variables. So I don't want you to get too hung up on this. I do want you to understand how to produce a linear regression model using Excel because I do not want you to have to go through the matrix arithmetic to do that. You could, but, uh, man, I would not suggest it. Hey, is the model significant? Last little point. Of today's discussion. Well, in order to test the significance of the model, we could take a look at the ratio of mean squares for regression, which is 4179339, divided by mean squares for error, which is 59786. It turns out that number is 69.90, bigger than 1 for sure. And if we wanted to do this test at the 0.05 level, the um, critical value would be 1.95. Now you see that down here in this cell A33. I found that value using the F inverse function with 8 and 4, 491 degrees of freedom, which are the degrees of freedom associated with the uh, sum of squares for regression and sum of squares error. So clearly 69.9 is bigger than 1.957. So we conclude that there are regression coefficients in our model which are not equal to zero because if all the regression coefficients were equal to zero then our f value would be much closer to one as we talked about the p-value associated with this test is given in this cell here f12 and the p-value is 0. 0.00076 of them three well uh, that's a very, very small p-value. And, and what's the ditty that we learned in statistics? If p is small, reject the null. And so we will reject the claim that there is no linear relationship amongst our set of predictor variables and our response variable called housing payment. And conclude, therefore, that there is a linear association between that set of predictor variables that we included in the construction of our model and the uh, response variable housing payment. Well, there's a lot in this particular uh, discussion. I've tried to highlight some of the uh, more important things from your reading in this, uh, in this uh, particular video presentation. And I would ask you to take a look at the, um, I would ask you to take a look at, of course, uh, the uh, 
the PowerPoint slides associated with the presentation, but most importantly, the Excel workbook that I will make available to you so that you can look through it uh, and uh, you know feel comfortable with the arithmetic and the outputs and the results that uh, that were generated. Again, don't worry too much about the introduction of qualitative variables in our model at this point. I will discuss in more detail with you the use of indicator or dummy variables later on in this course, and uh, you'll be able to master that subject. For now, take a look at uh, how to use Excel to build this model. I think it would be in your best interest. Okay, until next time, this is uh, Professor Len Kelly. Uh, onward is the, is the key.